but I focus on on big cities and a few things that these big cities have going for them is that um, they have a higher concentration and a better developed infrastructure of kind of immigrant serving organizations, particularly kind of what we call the long established gateways. So cities that have long been experiencing uh, the arrival of immigrants and uh, immigrants have developed their own organizations and, and these organizations have stayed around. So I'm thinking of cities like New York and Chicago and Boston and San Francisco, they fall in that kind of category. They have a lot of these organizations uh, that help immigrant communities um, these also tend to be more kind of politically progressive places, right? So there's lots of local government officials who self-identify as progressives, are sympathetic toward the plight of immigrants, and want to work with immigrant organizations to, to create new policies and programs. There's other places where these community organizations work with the city in trying to put up a defense against um, anti-immigrant policies that are coming most visibly from the federal government, but in some places also from states, right? Depending on what state you're talking about. Uh, Texas isn't all that great of a state for immigrant rights, neither is Georgia, you know, some of the southern states. Um, but they will come together to, to, um, to figure out lo like local responses to those policies. Um, so one area where we've seen this most recently is that community advocates have been advocating for more local funding for immigration legal services um, and cities, I'm um, thinking like San Francisco and New York, have made available funding that is then um, uh, that is then contracted to these organizations to provide immigration legal services to at-risk immigrants and immigrants that are that are that are in deportation proceedings, for example. The mayor of, of Budapest. Uh, and also um, a not good number of other larger municipalities um, changed and they are now in the united opposition. Um, this meant, uh, I think, a lot of um, perspectives for civil society. One of the main challenges, I think, in, for Hungarian civil society organizations that want to promote democracy and human rights is how to actually have access to communities if it's risky for a for a venue owner to rent you their space for an afternoon to have a public meeting discussing um, the any any human rights related topic then it becomes impossible to engage with the public and this has happened a lot so um, now i think this has also meant for civil society that there is more space to engage with the public in very important municipalities it also has meant that there is finally space to engage with public authorities local authorities and and that can actually help individual communities and 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 society um, ultimately because then it can mean that services are becoming better um, there is discussions um, focusing, for example, in Budapest on how to tackle the problem of homelessness, how to tackle all sorts of social inequalities, injustices, how to um, promote um, equal uh, treatment policies. So this is where civil society can engage finally with some actors. And sadly, on these exactly the same issues. It's almost impossible to engage with the, with the national government. So that did mean quite a lot of hope. Um, this, uh, this also means that, um, that civil society, not necessarily the formal human rights organizations, but movements and, and informal mobilization really matters. And many of the, of the, um, opposition mayors were assisted by, you know, civic initiatives. Where the immigrants um, and migrants and people who are undocumented are going to get protection from are from three areas. One is from some state governments, if they're lucky to be in that state, two, from city governments, if they're lucky to be in that city, and three, from the communities that have been forming and the social movements that have been forming around immigration. So 
just like um, the Black Lives Matter protests now are not relying on litigation on the city, on the state, or the federal level to say that police uh, police in racist ways, that there is an extermination of black people that is happening, and that they should be defunded. These are the people in the United States that are pushing and creating tremendous political pressure on federal, primarily state and local governments. I think that there is a real possibility that we will see that same outpouring with respect to migrants and immigration um, as we begin to move forward. Um, you know, we like, in the United States, there are three branches of government. There's the executive, which is the president, the legislative branch, which is Congress, and the judiciary, which is the judges. But there's also a fourth branch of government, uh, that's the people. And in this particular moment, in the context of COVID, in the context of uh, the killing of, uh, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we're actually seeing the people flex their muscles in the way that they don't usually do in the United States. Um, and that's a very important piece. And it will extend to much more um, than black lives. It will also extend to people who are Native American, to people who are immigrant, to people who are gay, lesbian, queer, gender nonconforming. Uh, this is this is the this is the fertile ground that I think we can look forward to over the next several years. Mm -hmm.